I was worried that people would think that it was closing down. After vandals target a struggling restaurant, a call for help summons artists willing to aid a stranger. It just gave us a little bit of hope. I've never had any formal horse training. In our fast-paced world, meet a man who's made a living for decades, traveling in the slow way. Come on, baby. Gee up. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, these are tough times, but a birthday party for a veteran turning 103 is something to smile about. These stories and more next on City Street. Happy birthday, Gene. Hello, I'm Enrique Cerna. Welcome to a special city stream from my home, my living room, actually. The global pandemic has forced us all to accept a new way of life, and for this show, a new look. No production crew with fancy cameras and lights, just me and my iPad. Staying home is helping us stop the spread of this highly contagious virus. Downtown streets, usually clogged with cars, are wide open as thousands of workers telecommute. Many others have no job to go to. Including those who wait tables, tend bar, and cook meals. Many restaurants have closed. Others are boarded up because they fear racially motivated attacks. But during tough times, the best of humanity appears. Producer Randa Ng shows what can happen when people rise up. I was driving by Jade Restaurant and I saw that there were contractors who were hanging up boards on the windows. And I was concerned because I thought that the restaurant was closing down. So I stopped and talked to the owner's son. His name is Eric. He said that someone had broke out the window and showed me a picture of the broken window. I was worried that further vandalism would occur and people would think that it was closing down. And I wanted something aesthetically pleasing, not only to for the restaurant, but for the neighborhood as well. So when people drove by Jade Restaurant, they actually wanted to go in. I put a call out for artists and within 30 minutes, I had five artists who said, hey, we want to do something. The whole community of artists that came to help Jade Restaurant were from the Latino community, some who were even actually laid off from their job. They donated their time and their expertise to this project, and I'm really thankful. There was five different panels that they painted. None of the artists really had a concrete idea of what they're going to do. They had some sort of idea, and uh, the, the, the last one, the Jay Garden panel, they actually kind of did that together, which is very reminiscent of the Gang of Four, where you have communities from all different uh, backgrounds supporting our neighborhoods to make sure that we're taking care of one another. Eric, who is uh, the owner's son, once again, he already expressed that he wants to hang the signs inside the restaurant once this is all over. As different communities are, we are hurting. We are feeling different levels of trauma because of this, and we're challenged by this. Our families are challenged, our children, and Having something like this just gave us a little bit of hope. The artists in this story have chosen to remain anonymous because they believe their craft is still considered underground. Meantime, Seattle police say there is no direct evidence the vandalism at Jade Garden is a hate crime. But other minority businesses have been targeted. Chief Carmen Best teamed up with my friend Lori Matsukawa to spread the word that this will not be tolerated. Washington State is no place for hate. In a show of solidarity between police and community, I'm joined today by Lori Matsukawa. Thank you, Chief. You know, hate crimes have no place in our community. We're better than that, Washington. We're all trying to deal with the COVID-19 public health crisis together. If you are a victim of a hate crime or hate-based harassment, please call 911. Exactly, Lori. We will document and investigate every reported hate crime. Even racist name-calling should be reported to police. We take this information very seriously. If you aren't sure if a hate crime occurred, call 911. We are here to help, 
and will respond to investigate. When we work together, we're safer together. Ahead on City Stream, we'll take you on a unique slow speed view of the city you can only get from one man. Kia. Just a few months ago, downtown streets were packed with people rushing to a restaurant, a show, or a store to finish their holiday shopping. But within weeks, our hectic lives would go from a sprint to stagnation as the coronavirus hit. One man who prefers a sluggish pace has been traveling in the slow lane for decades. Producer Ian DeVere goes for a spin on the streets of Seattle. Ready to ride, folks. It's been an amazing thing. I came came here from New Orleans in the late 70s, and uh, by the time I made it up here, I had 50 bucks left. I set choke, worked in the mills out in Forks, and worked as a shake rat, planted trees, and made some money. And at the same time, I was going down to New Orleans every winter, at right before Mardi Gras, and they would always hire extra drivers for the Jazz and Heritage Festival would start to get hot in May, and I'd head back up to the Northwest. I bought the first wagon in, I think, in late 76. I bought this old grain wagon. I didn't have enough money to buy a carriage. And I was training the horse to drive, you know. And I was pretty green then. I didn't, I've never had any formal horse training. I just learned by osmosis, or by watching other people do it, basically. Come here, Amos. So we use these rubber shoes to provide uh, excellent traction and cushioning for uh, working on the streets. And I didn't, I didn't get much positive feedback from people. You know, people were, were, uh, thought it was kind of a crazy idea. Oh, it rains all the time, there's no tourists, and everybody's poor here, so what are you going to do? <laughs> I said, well... I'd rather just do it cheaper and allow for everybody to go for fragments. Oh. Uh, There's two words you use on horses, G and haw. G is right, haw is left. Come on. Come on, Amos. G up. Mm. the monorail that was built for the world's fair the transportation of the future they built it he took me for the first time as a newlywed couple yeah. last newlywed, year yeah so this is our second uh, our second um, opportunity with, with Steve and Amos come on Amos G up we used to do a lot of proposals over 2,000 proposals and that was about I think about 10 years ago I stopped you know documenting it but uh, the record was five proposals in one day. Of course, every one of them said yes. So on my business card, it says, propose in my carriage, they never say no. It's cool. People come down here over the, you know, over the 46 years of the business. People will come back down here and say, oh, I, I proposed in your carriage. It was like 25 years ago. I have kids now. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely the slow lane. I like I like to create slow food and slow events. What are you honking at, fool? Everybody's in such a rush now all the time. They're always rushing everywhere. And I never really wanted to live like that, so I guess that's why I decided to you know be an organic farmer and drive a horse carriage because it's, I could have been doing the same thing a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago. Well, I have a farm out in, uh, near Issaquah. 
and uh, I'm splitting up with my partner, and I either I'm gonna buy her out or I'm gonna sell the place, one of the two, so. It's all up in the air as far as whether or not uh, I'm gonna be able to keep my farm. You know, it's, everything runs off the farm, the food and the horses stay there. It's difficult to make money as a small farmer. That's why being a small farmer is kind of like being a musician. You gotta have a day job usually. Yeah, we used to have, at the peak of it, we had about 15 carriages on out here. And I, for 35 years, I ran four, four carriages. I think there was five or six companies at one point. There would be a line all the time. I mean, it was incredible. You'd come out here 24 hours a day, practically, and there'd be people waiting for you. I just, I just wanted to thank all the people come down and uh, taken carriage rides over the years. And, the weddings to the funerals, to the christenings, to the quinceaneras and the bat mitzvahs and just everything you can possibly imagine I think we've done in the carriages. I'll drive horses somewhere sometime. I don't, you know, I've been doing it for over 50 years. It's kind of in my blood now, so I don't intend on uh, stopping it. When I first came to Seattle, I thought, man, this is heaven. It's Hard to believe how much has changed. Really, it's a totally different place than what it used to be. A lot of people are. They come down and they go. So where are the carriages? I said, right here. <laughs> this is it. I'm the one and only at this point. Well, after more than 40 years in business, Steve Beckman has given thousands of carriage rides. Two of his more noteworthy customers former Seattle Mariners Jay Buhner and Jamie Moyer. We'll be right back. We know that this Army Field Hospital is going to be critical to the response here in Seattle. It will reduce the burden on our hospitals here. And that was Mayor Jenny Durkin on March 28th, announcing the CenturyLink Field Events Center would be transformed into a 150-bed hospital for non-COVID-related patients. It only took the Army about one week to get that facility ready to go. But before it accepted any patients, the decision was made to disassemble the entire hospital and send it to another city in greater need. Governor Jay Ensley said more favorable projections of the coronavirus outbreak in the Seattle area allowed him to make that call. Seattle is home to some of America's finest medical research firms, including an organization that has done in-depth modeling related to the coronavirus. We're talking about the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is part of the University of Washington School of Medicine. Joining us now is Dr. Greg Roth, a cardiologist and associate professor with the IHME. Dr. Roth, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Enrique. Doctor, tell us more about your organization and how it's helping in this fight against the global pandemic. IHME uh, is an independent research institute at the University of Washington. And early in the course of this outbreak, uh, the University of Washington uh, medical system asked IHME to assist in trying to predict the uh, healthcare utilization needs that were expected to be quite significant. And that includes the needs of hospitals to put people in intensive care units and also on ventilators. The IHME recently came out with new information that suggests the need for hospital beds, ICU beds, and ventilators will not be as high as first thought. Why is that? And what does that tell you? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And you know, one of the things that we decided early on was that the purpose of a model was not to take a single snapshot in time of what this was going to look like, but to have a flexible framework that could use new information as it showed up. And so early on, most of what we knew came from places like Wuhan in China. And increasingly, we're seeing what the epidemic curve looks like in places like Italy and Spain and the United States. And as that information accumulates, we feed it into the model and then update it every day. We're fortunate in the state of Washington that many of these really important public health measures were instituted relatively earlier compared to some places. And it does appear 
that we are now beginning to see the really important impact. Are you worried about a second wave of infection if social distancing measures are relaxed too soon? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, what we know is that reducing contact between people is one of the most important ways to control recurrent outbreaks because the number of people in the end who appear to be exposed to the virus is relatively small, that means that there's no immunity building up in the population. Um, but for now, at least through the data we have as of yesterday in the state of Washington, it appears that the rapid increase in death rates that we were seeing is no longer occurring. Does it concern you that some states still have not issued stay-at-home orders? Well, I mean, as a physician and as a public health scientist, I just want to emphasize again that working together as a community and uh, advocating for these kinds of measures that can make a difference is really important. And we know that even in states where the policies haven't been adopted early, uh, cities and towns have adopted those policies, and that can make a big difference. How have countries like South Korea managed to control the effects of the virus? Uh, their infection rate and deaths to COVID-19 are a fraction of what we have in the U.S. I'm not sure I can explain it. I mean, one of the things we're doing at this point is observing a lot of variation in the death rates in different places. Um, you know, the number of individuals who travel to different locations initially appears to be one of the things that drives where the epidemic occurs uh, earliest and where it spreads fastest. And we know that, you know, every country is actually a collection of neighborhoods and neighborhoods are, you know, collected together into cities. And there's going to be a lot of variation between different places. Um, we know that, for example, in the Seattle area, one of our earliest outbreaks or clusters was in a nursing facility where at the highest ages and with significant health comorbidities, the death rate, quite sadly, was very high. So what is your best advice to folks out there? I mean, that's a great question. This is a really challenging time and one that none of us, to be honest, really, uh, you know, had thought a lot about in advance. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, I'm a cardiologist in addition to um, working at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. So I'll tell you what I tell my patients. Uh, wash your hands many, many times a day and do it for 20 or 30 seconds really carefully. Uh, avoid touching your face your eyes, your mouth, your nose, your ears as much as possible. Avoid crowds, and in particular, if you're at an older age, over the age of 60, and if you have chronic health conditions, you wanna be really careful about avoiding contact with other people while we're still in this time of social distancing. And then if you're not feeling well, be sure to reach out and contact your healthcare provider. Even though health systems and hospitals have been pivoting really rapidly to try and make space for COVID-19 patients, we're still there to take care of people when they're not feeling well for a whole range of reasons. Well, we thank Dr. Greg Roth from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation for joining us. We'll be right back. This beautiful ride of spring is off limits right now, but we'll show you the cherry blossoms as CityStream continues. During these times of uncertainty, it's normal to feel overwhelmed and a sense of dread. Experts say one way to cope is to accept your anxiety and unease. And if you think it'll only exacerbate your problem, listen to psychologist Dan Mosley. It is healthy to pause and sit for a structured period of time, allow the feelings of anxiety to actually wash over you, to accept that I'm feeling bad, I'm feeling anxious, I'm worried. As soon as I acknowledge to myself, I am scared to death, right away, my anxiety dissipates a little bit because I have acknowledged that rather than 
doing something to temporarily distract myself from that experience. And that's something that's really hard for me. I think for everybody, it's sort of like to say, yes, I am feeling totally overwhelmed and swamped and I have no clue what I'm going to do tomorrow. Whoa, I can't go there, I can't go there because, oh, then what, then what, then what? And then, I gotta have a plan, I gotta do something. Well, yes, planning is going to be helpful, but you need to give yourself permission to being anxious in that moment. Hard to do. Why we avoid that is because we think that acknowledging that will in and of itself add to the feeling of being overwhelmed. And so we said, I don't want to feel any worse. So if I allow myself to feel what I am in the moment, then all of a sudden it's going to escalate. Not the case. My anxiety goes down a couple of notches because I was able to release that rather than, who, me? I've got all these responsibilities here. I can't, can't take time for myself. I've got to do this. I, well, taking care of yourself is the first step in taking care of those around you, right? Exercise is one way to ease anxiety. Any other year, I might suggest a scenic walk through the University of Washington Quad since the cherry blossoms are in bloom, but not this year since we're avoiding crowds. Let's try the next best thing, a video tour of this rite of spring. Thanks to our producer, Randy Ng. This is the first time here for the year. And the sun's beautiful, the cherries are beautiful, so it's like, there's no reason not being here. So beautiful. Oh, the blossoms that are at their peak. This is the first time to come and see the cherry blossoms. I'm from Manila, Philippines. I have not seen cherry blossoms in my life until now. So beautiful. It's like um, you appreciate the beauty of nature and it's very calming. It's like it gives you a sense of peace. Yes, this is Addison's first time coming to see the cherry blossoms. Spring is here and I love the weather in Seattle, spring and summer, and so it just gets me excited for the months to come. I'm not giving the spot as long as the sun is out. As long as the sun is out, I'm not giving it up. Unless some person comes along who desperately needs to sit down. It's a big spot. It's perfect. She found it, actually. We she have the it. magnolia tree. We have the camilla. We have the, the cherry blossoms. We have all the people. What more could we ask for? And the sun. We came to take pictures with our daughter. It's a beautiful day in Seattle, so we had to take our opportunity. And of course, now you're gonna be upset. People in Seattle always seem to come out when the weather is nice, don't miss a beat, you know? I've never seen so many people here before. This is quite, quite cool. I was coming out of the car, and then I saw a glimpse of the cherry blossom, and I was like, there it is, there it is, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh, we have to go down now. And then my friends are laughing at me, you are so funny. And then I was really walking fast and started to take pictures. The colors, the, the, the way it looks as, you know, the lineup of trees. So it's very pretty. Always the fascination of the UW, like all the people are being attracted here. It always gave me the sort of atmosphere you know, of being peaceful, and so that's why I sometimes come here and play some bamboo flute. There's no way you can walk under these trees. 
and not get a good feeling. They, if you look around right now, if they're not taking pictures or posing for pictures, they're just in awe of what's around them. And I, I feel everybody feels like that when they come here. It warms my heart to see other people, everyone else enjoying the, the, uh, the cherry blossoms. Yes, it is a beautiful day, so we are very lucky. From blossoms to birthdays, we end with a very special celebration for a World War II veteran who is 103 years young. Because of the pandemic, his party was replaced by a parade. We salute Eugene Moy. Happy birthday. So today's a very special day. My dad's turning 103. Happy birthday, Gene! We love you! <laughs> it's amazing. You know, I take it for advantage that my dad's 103, you know. I don't realize how blessed I am to have a father at that age. We usually have a big gathering at the Renton Senior Center. Um, unfortunately, he's not allowed to dance because of what's happening with the virus. You know, the coronavirus is keeping us from doing all kinds of things. So I wanted to celebrate his birthday no matter what. So we're going to have a little surprise caravan parade for him in front of his house. We're going to go to the driveway. This is going to be a surprise because he doesn't know anything about it. Okay, go over here. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy Whoa. birthday. <laughs> I feel great. Yeah, I never expected all this. This is overwhelming. Happy birthday. Uh, thank you, thank you. It's just nice to know that he's thought about and that he's loved and, you know, I just think he's like a national treasure. He's 103 and also he's a World War II veteran and he's going to be receiving his Congressional Gold Medal. Yeah, and that's all been put on hold and uh, we don't know when that's going to proceed. He's a little disappointed and he knows it'll probably happen one day. Yeah, when, when they're ready, I'll be going. Happy birthday, Gene, from the Seattle Police Department. We love you, brother. He's been isolated by himself. What he loves most is going out dancing and socializing with his friends. He hasn't been able to do that. Yeah, I can hardly wait till we get back on the dance floor. <laughs> Happy birthday! At 103, every day, he, he just appreciates each day. I don't know, I just live normally like everybody else. I'm just lucky, that's all. Yeah, I'm just lucky. What a beautiful sight and so deserved. That wraps up this episode of City Stream from my home, Casa Serna. If you'd like to learn more about the great shows on the Seattle Channel, visit our website, seattlechannel.org, and click on Feature Shows. I'm Enrique Cerna. Thank you for watching. Be safe, be healthy, and be careful out there.